So you probably didn't even know how important dog nutrition was, and yet you still clicked on my ugly mug. Well, I'm grateful. Uh, honestly, you're probably out there just thinking, whoa, this guy did what I'm going to assume is going to be uh, half an hour on just talking about dog nutrition. Can't I just go and get the uh, dog food from the grocery store? No! Well, maybe, but for the sake of the energy, keep keeping it up. No! No, you can't. You're supposed to come and listen to me. Who am I? Nobody. I just have had uh, about 10 years of, uh, you know, working at a pet store, five years dog trainer, one year dog groomer, that whole time learning about nutrition. I'm not a vet, but you might want to listen to me real quick because I got something to say. Not going to lie, I might even do uh, two episodes on this because it's probably going to be some stuff that I miss. That's how much there is to cover on dog nutrition. It's crazy. Like, if you're ready for a deep dive, let's get into a deep dive, all right? I'm going to deep dive. You can deep dive? So, oh, God, I don't even know if you have a puppy or if you have an adult dog that you just got. Oh, that's right. It doesn't matter. Your dog, whether you just got it as a puppy or you just got it as an adult, is going to already be on some food. And it would behoove you to figure out what that food is. Um, even if it's a food that you're not planning on feeding them for the rest of their life, it's still important that you find out what it is, you go, you pick up a five pound bag of it, and then you use that to help transition the dog to the new food that you want to feed them. Um, transitioning is going to be a great place to start. I might as well. So, uh, whatever time, whenever time that you trade a dog's food out, you want to do it in stages so that they don't get loose stool. And unfortunately, if you have a puppy, you, it's going to be tough to avoid loose stool unless you use my magical secret ingredient that I'm going to reveal later. I want to keep you guys glued in. Um, but for right now, when it comes to transitioning, so whatever old food that they're eating, you want to get them some new stuff. So what you want to do is all of their stuff, none of your stuff. And then some of your stuff, a little of their, you know, more of their, you know, some more of their stuff. But, you know, you can just keep going that way, you know, 50-50 and then... You know, wean them off of the old stuff, and then pretty soon, now they're only eating the new stuff. Well, depending on how old the dog is, you know, what shape they're in, uh, how dramatic the increase in food is, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, there isn't a set science to how long you should be able to do it for. Um, you know, maybe you only have enough for four days, and so you have to do boom, 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 boom. You know, that's fine. And there's methods that you can do to help minimize the results like that secret ingredient. Oh, I'm going to keep teasing you until it comes time. <laughs> You're going to laugh when you find out what it is, but that's all right. So, you know, you transition the food. To what? What kind of food should I be feeding the dog? Well, gosh, that is just a huge can of worms. But let's just start out with saying uh, you definitely want to do dry. All right. You, wet food, canned food especially. Canned food is not a complete diet for a dog. For some reason, a lot of small dog owners think that they can do canned food for the dog's life, and that's not the case at all. Um, that's actually going to malnourish the dog. Uh, there are some foods that you can either rehydrate, you know, um, that come in a liquid form that way, that as long as they say can be used as a complete meal across the front, those ones are safe to use. But just for a rule of thumb, assume that canned means topping at best and sparingly at that. Um, and obviously, you know, like, let's say that you just adopted a 17-year-old Pomeranian that was on the streets and doesn't have any teeth left. I mean, obviously, you can't just do hard kibble, but there are ways around that. You know, you have, uh, you know, fresh foods from refrigerator. You have uh, freezer foods. Um, you have, like I talked about earlier, the ones where you, it's dehydrated, you mix it in, and then it's just a mush that they eat. Um, there's plenty of ways to keep your dog healthy without having to do hard kibble, without just resorting to canned food, Okay. Sorry, God, that almost sounded like a angry rant. I mean, it's it's just an argument that I've had enough times before that there's going to be some emotion to this. All right, um, just a little, you know, back backstory. So, ninety percent of the problems when I was working at a pet store uh, could have been come from nutrition. So, you know, the pet parent comes in and they say, "Oh, my dog has itchy ears. Maybe it's mites," or they say, "Oh, my dog has, uh, you know, a red belly." or my dog has, you know, hot spots, or my dog keeps chewing their paws, um, you know, all of these things, and they assume that they can just get a spray 
to uh, to you know deal with it. And every single time, I would start the conversation with, well, "What are they eating? You know, genuinely, what are you putting into their body? Because this is more likely internal than external." Um, granted, I don't want to deter people from if their dog has ear mites to treat them. You know, um, it, you know, or if they're just scratching the ear because you don't clean it out. Um, and, you know, be careful with that. If you've seen my grooming episode, you know, don't use a Q-tip. Don't get anywhere where you can't see. But, you know, if the dog ear is clean and it is free of mites and they're still itching, well, I can almost guarantee it's an internal thing. Um, yes, there are some dogs that have seasonal allergies. For instance, this one's allergic to uh, ragweed. You might be able to hear in the background. I'm going to have her loose while we're doing this and... If she makes some background noise, she does. I mean, isn't that kind of part of the flavor of the fact that I'm enough of a dog lover that I'm letting her run free while I'm doing a video, even if it's going to possibly make it not as uh, professional looking? Um, you know, so anyway, it's, uh, you know, if you do get a dog's particular food, um, reading the back of the bag it, it almost becomes an art form, but I can give you a little bit of the basics. So, you know, the first ingredient ideally should be meat. They're omnivorous, but they're mostly, you know, more carnivorous than uh, herbivores. So um, meat should be the first ingredient. And here's where it gets tricky. This is where it starts to get a little uh, sneaky. Um, how they phrase the ingredients is a big part of it. So if you're looking at the back of a bag of food and, you know, it says poultry... Well, that could be any bird. That could be chicken, you're assuming. It could be duck, you're hoping. It could easily be pigeon. If they're not going to specify, it's probably pigeon. So you definitely want it to say chicken or duck or, you know, a specific animal. Um, you also want to make sure that uh, you, don't un you don't misunderstand that, you know, byproducts are a bad thing, that meal is necessarily a bad thing. Um, so byproducts are you know, not the meat, you know, it could be the organs, it could be, you know, the skin, it, it could be, uh, you know, a couple of different things. Um, but if you think about it, if they were in the wild, they would be eating those parts of the body first. They usually save the meat for the last. If it's a uh, predator, they usually eat the um, intestines because it's easy, the skin because it's yummy, and then uh, they slowly gnaw at the actual meat of the animal. Um, that's not a healthy way to do it, you know, but they did a lot of running. They're fine with doing that. I'm just saying that if it's something has byproducts in it, as long as it's not the first ingredient, it isn't necessarily a bad thing to have. Um, it is nice when they get into more specifics. Like, for instance, there's some dog foods that will actually say um, boneless, you know, chicken meat or chicken breasts or something, like, you know, as the first ingredient. That's, that's a pretty high-end food right there. You know, um, so with meal, don't think that that's a bad thing either. So meal literally means that it's been ground up, compacted. Um, so technically, if meal is the first ingredient before the actual ingredient, so if, say, the first ingredient's chicken, which, by the way, like I was saying earlier, that could mean the entire chicken, feathers, beak, and all. So technically, even if it has chicken as the first ingredient, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the healthiest first ingredient that you could get. Um, chicken meal, so that, like, again, means it's compressed, you know, it's compacted, um, so it isn't necessarily unhealthy, um, but the process of, uh, you know, heating it up and all that stuff can actually affect, you know, the amount of nutrition that you get out of it too. So meal might technically be more actual chicken compressed, but it might actually have, you know, some negative effects as far as, uh, loss of vitamins. So that's why it's interesting. There is a brand in particular that I'm thinking of that has the, uh, meat and the veggies cooked in two separate um, kibbles because you actually lose even more of the vitamins if you try and cook vegetables at the same temperature as the meat. So um, the ones that don't have everything all in one that actually have it separated, it, it's actually not a bad idea. So again, you know, I haven't even gotten to specifics yet I, and already you're just like, that's a lot to process. Um, are, are you kidding me? Like, you know, can I just, you know, go get a bag or whatever? Oh, man. Um, no. <laughs> you can't. You can't. Uh, it seems like it's not a bad... Pardon me. ...thing at the time. Because I've noticed that a lot of the foods that you could get 
in a grocery store, um, you know, nice and cheap and seems like a good deal, that the dog won't have immediate health effects. It, it'll be long-term stuff, long-con stuff. <sighs> like, they might have a slightly drier and dustier coat than other dogs that you've pet before. And you just think that, oh, maybe that's just them, maybe it's just the uh, environment. Um, and then later on in life, you know, they'll get, you know, tumors and growths and, um, you know, all sorts of health issues. And you're just like, oh, well, it's just because they're getting older. Well, no, oftentimes it's because you started with a semi-inferior food. And so it was a cumulative effect over their entire lives where now you have this, like, you know, like a cancerous dog. And you just think, well, they got cancer because, you know, that's the breed or they get cancer because they were just that age. No, a lot of times if, if you do just like an okay food, <clears throat> you know, you're dealing with stuff a lot more long term than you realized. And like the more immediate obvious one is that, you know, if they have like a dry, dusty coat, um, you know, a lot of dandruff, like severe, like, you know, that that's just an inferior food. Actual allergies are usually, um, like I mentioned earlier, you know, like, you know, hot spots and biting the uh, feet and, you know, scratching the ear um, excessively, you know, that's almost always a good sign that they're reactive to something in there. Um, and I gotta, whew, I gotta take a pause, I gotta take a moment, um, cause I'm about to get into a subject that I have a bit of, uh, emotion about. <clears throat> so, grain-free does not necessarily mean better. Um, this, again, I don't research anything that I'm telling you. This is just what I've, this is just what I've heard. Just, just what I've heard. Uh, but, from how I gather it, it started off with, you know how dogs are bred for certain things, you know, some of them are actually bred for a job, you know, so, uh, you know, shepherds and retrievers, like, it's in the name, they were bred for shepherding and retrieving, so they have a natural inkling to do that. Most toy designer breeds were bred for size and not for really personality traits, health traits, or anything other than their size, and normally if you're going to go for small, I'm sorry, but you know, that's the runt of the litter paired with the runt of the litter, and then you get the runtiest of those litters, and then you keep doing that until you have a teeny tiny little teacup dog. There's going to be some health problems. And so, yes, a lot of, you know, celebrities, royalty, higher up people, you know, didn't usually get a working dog. They would often get a, you know, small, you know, like I can carry it in my sleeve, kind of, you know, like, oh, it warms the feet of my, you know, bed dog and so a lot of those dogs had issues most often food allergies to grain and so uh these higher up people would have to get you know specialty foods made that were grain free and so people the peasants <laughs> would see them uh feeding them the grain free food and so they think grain free equals better and so slowly over the course of the years it seemed to me a narrative that grain free is the better type of food and so if you didn't do grain free what are you doing to your dog and so pretty soon hiring companies were getting you know at least always having a grain free option to the point where they would actually have the majority of their um, output be grain free foods because that's where the market was and weirdly there was a study that came out that didn't actually technically even say that grain free was bad it was a half-assed study like you know the, some of the bigger brand names that i can think of weren't on the study so you know I'll tell you something right there but um, the gist was is that technically, yes, if you do grain-free and then you don't have a uh, taurine or L-beta carotene supplement in there, and other big words that I don't know, um, because they usually would use grains to process that naturally. If they don't have the grains, then it needs to be supplemented to them. And some of the foods didn't have that. Higher-end ones did. So um, if you had a lower-end uh, grain-free food, oftentimes it could lead to health issues like an enlarged heart and some other stuff. Um, again, none of this, you know, please do your research. I'm probably talking out of my butthole, but they had this piece of paper. The vets that have been telling people for years, grain-free doesn't necessarily mean better, finally had a piece of paper that kind of said, you know, what they've been trying to say all along, so they've been shoving it in their face and uh, saying, see, see, if the dog doesn't already have a grain-free allergy, having them on grains not only can do the stuff I've told you about, like um, they can develop a grain allergy if they have no experience with grains whatsoever, um, but also, yeah, you know, they, they use grains to make and process other stuff. So depriving them of that is actually a bad thing. 
So now, then there was a sudden big jump to, you know, like doing not grain free foods when ironically the dog that was like 13 but looked like they were three, you know, was thriving on, you know, <clears throat> and the vet was suggesting something like much lower rent grocery store that you can immediately get. Probably the first one that is coming to your head. Yeah, that one. Um, you know, they could get that instead. And so I had all these people like, you know, trying to go from like the higher end to the lower end. And it just drew me batty because it was like something's being lost in translation here that um, grain free doesn't necessarily mean bad, especially if your dog literally is allergic to certain grains. Um, but there are wholesome grains out there. Like, you know, for a dog, you know, uh, if the grain is sweet potato or brown rice, I mean, that's not going to be a bad grain for them. And it's uh, just something that's weird. So, like, you know, if you had thoughts about grain free before, um, you know, I, I hope that that makes you research it a little bit more. Same thing with raw. Let's do raw real quick. I mean, why not? We're already on grain free. Let's do raw. So if you just start feeding your dog raw meat and don't do any research, you're going to start making their teeth crack and their poo poisonous. Some dogs eat their own poo. Other dogs eat their poo. Um, even just local wildlife might eat their poo. And, you know, <clears throat> either way, you just don't want to have poisonous poo. Uh, teeth cracking either, you know, but it's weird. But, you know, yeah, okay. So if they were wolves, they'd be eating raw. Well, there's a lot of factors in that. First of all, they're not wolves anymore. And also, um, you know, wolves can get sick from raw meat too. So if you're going to do raw, do your research, you know, either use a uh, licensed business, you know, that makes it from a freezer, uh, or, you know, you definitely research the crap out of doing it your own. I don't recommend just going into raw willy nilly. Um, you know, that's completely different from the refrigerated fresh pet, you know, uh, you know, fresh stuff that you can get for your pet. Um, you know, that, that stuff is a different animal. Uh, I'm talking about the people that think raw, you know, cause they think wolf diet. So that's, that's the thing is there's almost every high end food has like, you know, a, like with, like they would eat in the wild, 90% protein and stuff. Well, they're not wild anymore. And they're also not having that kind of lifestyle anymore. So not only is their metabolism different, but their exercise is different too. So I don't see the reason for having, you know, your lack of energy, you know, mutt having a wolf diet, you know, if 90% of their time is spent indoors, maybe playing with a ball. I mean, that's not chasing prey across a plane is all I'm saying. So I digress. If you've stuck with me for this long, I think it's time to unveil my favorite ingredient, my secret ingredient, <clears throat> the the surprisingly cheap and, you know, anyway, pumpkin puree, pumpkin puree, hooray for pumpkin puree, all right, this sounds like a commercial for pumpkin puree, it sounds like I'm reading off of a docket right now, but I am not. This is something that I genuinely think is a miracle food. I don't know how it works, but let's say that your dog is um, having some digestive issues. Pumpkin puree. Let's say that your dog, you know, isn't sure of its new food and it needs a little appetite stimulant. Pumpkin puree. I'm not, I, I'm going to tell tales out of school and say that I even think that it helps cats with hairballs. I don't know. Look that one up. But, uh, ooh. Let's say that your dog has some loose stool. Pumpkin puree will tighten that right up. Oh, but what if they're constipated? Obviously, you shouldn't use pumpkin puree. Nope, that'll loosen it up for you too. I don't know how it works. I don't know how it knows what it needs to do. Either soften the stool or tighten the stool, whatever it is that you need. Pumpkin puree is just, it's, it's you know, awesome. <laughs> kind of fizzled out at the end there but uh yeah no i'm talking about literally pureed pumpkin in a can like the stuff that you would get uh you know dollar a buck at the grocery store you know uh, a buck a can at the grocery store it it's um it, it's useful for so many different things and you know as you can imagine it's just pureed pumpkin so you know it's pretty darn healthy too um yeah it most 90 percent. you know 98 anytime i use a percentage by the way 90 percent, 98 percent um, that is not from any research. That is just me using it as a catchphrase. So that is, uh, not science. So when I say 90% of the problems of your dog, then you walk in, uh, is going to be food related. Uh, you know, that's not a s actual statistic. So 
Long story short, pumpkin puree. Um, it works as an appetite stimulant. So uh, if you you know throw a glop onto a you know food that they, that you're putting them onto, you know um, again digestive aid. You know if they seem to have digestive issues, it seems to help with that too. It's just it does a lot. But my favorite thing is the fact that it knows. Oh, still too tight. Loosen it up. Still too loose. Tighten that up. I got you. I know. I know what you need. So, um, yeah, it's a nice little home remedy. I love little, um, you know, life hacks like that. And that's one where it it, it can't be uh, understated, you know, overstated enough. Um, so, yeah, pumpkin puree is my little Easter egg. So while I'm talking about unexpected foods for a dog. Maybe I should get into um, foods that the dog should not have. I already touched upon that with the raw, you know, unless you're careful. But definitely, um, I think everybody knows about chocolate. Maybe a little too much. So with chocolate, let's say they just scooped a couple lemon M's off the floor that got spilled. You don't have to go to the vet, okay? Like, you know, we're, we're talking... It had to be a pretty substantial size chocolate. Now, keep in mind, obviously, if you have a you know a toy sized dog, you know a little chocolate goes a long way. Like a lot of people don't really think about breaking that down in the ratio. But like if a dog, you know, if it, if a little uh, teacup has you know a bite of burger about that big, well, that'd be the equivalent of us picking out on five whole sized burgers. You know, so a little bit of chocolate obviously is going to be a little more detrimental to a smaller dog. But generally, in a, as a whole, you know, a couple M and M's aren't aren't going to kill it. Um, but you obviously should keep away from chocolate. Now, some of the ones that I hadn't heard of before, for instance, are uh, grapes and raisins. So, yeah, the dog shouldn't eat grapes and raisins, too. Like, normally you'd think a dog should eat nearly everything that a human eats because they're omnivores, we're omnivores. But, no, when it comes to grapes and uh, raisins, again, it probably has to be a substantial amount. But, no, it's something that absolutely they should not go after. And... I'd never heard of that before in my lifetime. Everybody's heard of chocolate, but grapes, raisins, which is the same thing, just dried out. But, you know, it's still very saying because there's some people that don't realize that, you know. Um, <clears throat> garlic and onion <clears throat> is so healthy for us that you would assume that it would be healthy for dogs. You'd assume that garlic and onion would be the pumpkin puree for dogs. It would be the miracle food, you know. Um, but it's, but garlic and onion are actually not good for a dog, and it finally came to light. So, maybe to help you remember those ingredients, I'll tell you a little story about when I was growing up, and we had the dog at my dad's house that would, and whenever dad would have, like, you know, a barbecue, you know, like a get-together, um, she would be in the pen, and so people could, you know, go over and pet her and say hi, but, um, you know, she, she couldn't mingle because she's an escape artist, so, um, Every time that we had a uh, barbecue slash get together, uh, she would puke, and you know she would eat some grass and she would puke, and I couldn't figure it out. I was like, is it because she's eating the grass? And I did a little research, and no, no, no grass actually helps settle their stomach. Um, they eat the grass because they're feeling nauseous. So that's that's a misunderstood you know cause and effect thing. Um, so I was like, all right, so it's not the grass. So oh, it's the excitement. Everybody's around. You know, she, she gets to say hi to everybody, but you know only when they on their terms, so she can't like run around and escape. So she's just excited because of that. And no, what it was is that dad, you know, liked to do garlic and onion powder on his burgers when he was cooking them up for the company. And they would run over, you know, they would walk casually, saunt not run over, but casually saunter over with their burger to her pen and feed her a little, you know, the burger. She had enough garlic and onion in her and she would vomit. And now it makes sense, but it couldn't put two and two together back then. It took like over a decade. So... Yeah, apparently garlic and onions, great for us, horrible for them, who knew? Um, now, apricot, now, all right, now, so real quick, so garlic, and, uh, so at least with garlic, I have seen some dog pills that have garlic in them, so I don't know if this is something that, you know, if it's in a capsule and it goes past the stomach and then it's just in the intestines and it gets absorbed, it's healthy, or, you know, if it's literally not good for them and, you know, this, these people just haven't done their research. Um, I'm not sure. I think the garlic might still be healthy for them. It's just that it's something that unsettles their stomach. Again, research it. I haven't. Um, but, yeah, so garlic is a maybe, but uh, onion I definitely have heard is not good. Uh, apricots, apparently, um, can be fatal to a dog, but I don't know exactly why. So there is the food called aviderm, and 
they were very blatant in saying, hey, Evaderm, we have avocados. The dog's skin and fur and coat is going to be super healthy and sheeny and glossy and awesome. All right, so maybe the avocado meat is what's okay for them, and then it's the skin maybe or the pit. You know, maybe they can choke on the pit or the pits has, you know, like cyanide or arsenic in it or, you know, the skin is not good either. I, I don't know. I don't know. It seems like the meat might be healthy enough. Otherwise, the food company probably wouldn't put it on there. And maybe the, um, you know, pit or the skin is not good for them. Either way, if you're cutting up an avocado, don't leave it on the counter. If you have a counter jumper is what I'm trying to say. All right. Jeez, I'm taking, I should take a breath because. <sighs> all right. So, I don't know how much I got into it, but um, dialing way back when it comes to the, uh, you know, puppy food, you know, uh, 18 to 2 months for a large breed, which is 70 pounds over, or, um, you know, the rest can usually just do a year for puppy food, but puppy food is important because it has salt in it, <laughs> which seems so counterintuitive again, but, you know, salt is actually a important building block when they're getting older. And then once they are an adult, then just like us, we need to kind of cut the sodium out of our diet because now it's, you know, just a maintenance thing. Like you don't have to like grow. For, for example, when it comes to sodium and when it comes to um, just free range feeding with a puppy, wh whatever they eat, you know, like either it gets pooped out or it gets used for building later on. It usually doesn't get stored to like fat. But when they're an adult and especially senior, um, it's very easy to get obese because, you know, now it's like, oh, we got all the growth that we need. So just put that on reserve in case we don't have a good, you know, run of it. Um, so I'm delving a little bit into, you know, the dog training, but, um, you know, with free range feed, uh, again, it usually works out for the first year of the dog's life, but, um, you, you shouldn't get them adapt, uh, in the habit of that. You should definitely give them a meal time and, I've always gone with the one meal a day rule, but um, I do I, I do acquiesce that, you know, if it's a toy designer breed like, you know, uh, you know, teacup chihuahua or you know, like a minpin, then their stomach is so small that they actually do need more than one meal a day because their stomach just can't handle a whole day's worth of energy in one teeny little stomach content. So Usually as a whole, you know, like when you go to medium, medium-sized dog up, I generally just give them breakfast. Um, I find that that's a good way to, you know, let them, you know, nap in the afternoon. And then if I do want to do some training with them in the evening, then their stomach is nice and empty and they're ready for snacks when they, uh, you know, um, it comes time for training. So I, I feel like doing a breakfast. And again, I'm not a vet. Maybe I, I've been doing it all wrong and they're supposed to have dinner instead of breakfast. Um, maybe they're supposed to have five meals. I doubt it. But, <laughs> um, you know, that, that that's that's what I know as far as that goes. With free range feeding, look at it this way. From a dog's point of view, they are going to be, oh, I'm a little peckish. Eat some. Oh, I'm a little peckish. Eat some. And they're not going to have an empty, ravenous stomach basically. So if the dog is going to do some treat training, which I recommend doing training with treats, um, they're, they're not going to be hungry for them as much. So like you'd have to get some high value stinky treats. You'd only get through like three or four of them before the dog is like, oh, okay, I'm going to go sleep this off. So, you know, be thinking about that. It, it, you know, it, you want to have the dog Especially if, like, the dog starts to have, like, an you know, S reflux, you know, they're starting to, you know, puke up bile. It's There's nothing chunky there. There's just literally their, you know, like some yellow liquid. Yeah, uh, oftentimes it's because they thought that meal time was coming at this time. They made some bile, and then bile had nothing to do, and so they want to get rid of it. And now you're cleaning up puke. And they always go for the carpet. By the way, there is a reason. Just a little deep dive. If you've stuck with me this long, you're going to get two little Easter eggs. This is the first one, which is okay. But um, if you have a wood floor and you have a carpet, and you, it's just the littlest bit of carpet, and you feel like anytime they go to puke or uh, pee, they go onto the carpet, like it's malicious, like it's a mean thing that they're doing. No. Nine times out of ten, a dog doing something what you seem to be as like a slight on you is because it's natural instinct, and they're trying to scream at you what they're saying the opposite. And uh, so whenever they go, like, you know, for instance, especially pee on the carpet... Well, if you think about it, if they um, pee on, like, say, concrete or wood, 
the pee splatters and it gets their feet. And by nature, they want to be a clean kind of animal. They're not a cat that you know usually cleans themselves on a regular basis, so they try to have their natural instincts be clean. And so spraying all over their feet when they pee, I'm sorry to be blunt about it, they don't like to do. So they're going to you know try and find something that naturally absorbs it, like grass, or in this case, the best alternative is carpet. So you know when it comes time to puke, that doesn't really seem to make sense except for the fact that a they're already used to going to the um grass slash carpet for elimination but also if you think about the fact that they normally like to eat grass when they're feeling nauseous then they're going to go to the grass like thing when it comes time to puke you, th is it making sense a little bit yeah so um yeah that's a little insider info about how come dogs act the way that they do now you might not be as upset about them where it's just like they naturally go over there you're like nah, 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 and you get them over to the woods so that it's easier to mop up um anyway so all right so what have we covered so far because i didn't bring a bullet point list with me i'm gonna get more organized i swear because there's probably gonna be a point to this nutrition thing there's just so much to cover so we talked about you know the puppies the transitioning large breed Large breed puppy is so important too. I mean, you know, it's just, and it is what it is. It, it sucks, but you know, a, a large breed puppy formula is going to be uh, lower in calorie, which seems counterintuitive, but with the large breed, you actually want them to grow slow, kind of like a plant. Like you want a healthy, like their bones should be thick and, you know, a, like, you know, really dense. Um, same thing, you know, like with a plant with its stem, you know, if, if they don't see, if they see too much nutrition and not enough wear and tear growing up, it's going to be a thin stock that at the slightest breeze is going to crack. Whereas if it grows, you know, like subject to a lot of wind and doesn't have as much nutrients as it grows up, it, it's, it's a lot more sturdy and less prone to breaking. Very similar when it comes to raising a large breed on nutrition. Um, you don't want to skimp on, if it's a puppy, you don't want to neglect them with puppy food and get them adult. Same thing with large breed. You don't want to neglect them. Well, I don't have any other, you know, puppy food that's you know large breed so i'll just give you the puppy and you know you definitely want to do large breed it's 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 very important um same thing with exercising them again i'm getting more into the training thing but uh agility and stuff with a large breed you actually want them to be full grown before you even have them do a little leap over a fence um they actually need to have all of that foundation connective tissue unbroken bones you know all of that so that that way when they're carrying that much weight when they get older then they you know have all of that built up. So you actually want them lean and you want them, uh, you know, growing the insides, not the outside, if that makes any sense at all. Um, again, I might get into it more when I get into breeds, when I get into uh, training. But for right now, I uh, decided that there's definitely going to be a round two. So I'm probably just going to leave you with the second Easter egg that I promised because you've been such a good sport and keeping sticking with me throughout this time. So when it comes to nutrition, when it comes to training, I have already said before in the past, but I am a huge advocate of using treats for training as opposed to negative reinforcement. And well, how are you going to do that? Because especially when you're starting out, you're going to want to use a lot of training and a lot of treats, but you've been told that you shouldn't use more than 10% of their total diet as treats. Okay. So here's a nice <clears throat> little workaround for sticking with me. This is my little life hack for being able to do treats. Not mine personally. I learned it from a great dog trainer, but I'm passing it on to you because I just think that it's that awesome. You get a resealable jar, all right? Cover comes off, cover goes on. It's resealable, it's hopefully airtight. And then you just fill that 90% with a dog's kibble, all right? Just the regular everyday breakfast, main nutrition source, you fill it like 90%. You can do 70, 80, but, you know, fill it most of the way. Now, from here, you can kind of play around a little bit. You can actually use some of the dry biscuity treats. Um, so, you know, normally they come in a bone shape about yay big. <clears throat> and so just keep in mind that with a dog, uh, again, I'm getting more into the training aspect, but, you know, since you stuck around, this is nutrition slash training. For a dog, it doesn't matter how much they get, it's how many they get. So quantity over quali quality in a way. Um, basically, if you give them a whole bone dry biscuit treat every time that they do a sit, yes, good sit, yes, good sit, and then boom, you know, the dog's like, oh, three of those, 
all right, I'm going to go sleep that off. That was nice. And then you're like, no, 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 we still have like a half hour. So with a dog, if you take that same bone treat and then you break it into like, you know, eight, ten little pieces and then you feed them those, well, then they're like, oh, come, come, come. It's a gravy train that never ends. Like they don't care that, you know, they're like, I just got eight of those. And they're like, I only got one. Well, you know, they don't care that, you know, like the eight of them were still only like a quarter of the original treat. So for a dog, it's just all about how many you can give them. So like smallest pieces possible over a course amount of time. So then, um, you know, maybe you get the biscuity stuff. You just break it up nice and fine. Now here comes the actual training treats. So you know what I'm talking about, training treats. So it's like those little small moist stinky ones that come like you know eight ounces to you know 10 bucks for every eight ounce tiny little bag so those ones you can use as sparingly as possible you actually just took put took a, a little layer uh you know put it on top and so then you shake the you know cover it up you shake the whole thing up and then you just have it sit overnight and now the stinky treats and everything are just like mixing with the kibble by the time you know you actually give it to the dog the whole thing smells like the stinky kibble so, like, that's the most expensive part of your, like, treats and also the most, you know, like, malnutritious if you think about it. So, now you can actually take that small bag of treats, throw it in the fridge or freezer every once in a while because, like, you're going to be, like, using it that sparingly. 90% of what you're still feeding for treats is going to be kibble, but it's going to smell like the treats. So, now, not only are you keeping your dog from getting picky, now not only are you, um, you know, making the dog work for a lot less, but also... You can tra take out of that jar all day long, and their f total diet is never going to get more than 10% treats because you're starting out with a jar that's pretty much already 10% treats as it is. So if you just feed from them all day, so think about that. Also, it's not a bad idea. Again, I'm getting more into the training, but if you know that you're going to have a heavy training day, then take that out of their breakfast. You know, like if you usually do a cup and a half and you know you're going to do at least a half a cup's worth of training that day, Feed them a cup and leave them hungry for when it comes training time. They're still, they're still getting their full nutrition, but now they're working for what their food is, which is not only what they should be doing, but it's what they want to do, all right? You're not being a mean pet parent by making them work for their food. That's actually what they want to do. They freaking stress out. I'm getting more... In all right, you're getting much of a bonus episode today because I'm getting more into the dog training aspect than more the nutrition aspect, but with a dog, they need to want to work for their food. I'll get into that later. But a little sneak peek. Um, yeah, you, you. what's great is that you can catch me slipping. And now that I don't work at a pet store anymore, I'm not the competition. So if I do sneak in a little dog training advice from here and there, that's just your little Easter egg. That's not anything that I have to worry about uh, financially. Um, legally, not financially. Both, actually, if it comes to that. Anywho, um, I know there's so much more that I need to cover. But honestly, I think for right now, that is you know enough for you to digest. Uh, a nutrition pun, digest. Am I really going to end on that? Yep. Yep, I'm leaving it in. Ugh, I'm leaving it in.